You know why love is all we need? Not because it's a song or a neat thing to say. Love is all we need because God is, talked about that last week, 1 John 4, 7 and 8. God is love, verse 16 in 1 John 4. But today we're going to talk a little bit about something. I want you to just watch a, a, a video that's going to set this up for us. I'm hoping one of these days I'm going to be able to check off all those things on that list. <laughs> but I'm getting there a little bit every day. Man, I'm so much better than I was at all of those things than I was a few years ago, a few months ago. But it's not because of anything I do. It's because of God working through me. And, and, and praise the Lord for that. So today, I want to talk to you about a few things, but... The big idea is that love requires taking action. You can't just say, I love others. Take action. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 22. It'll be verses 34 to 40 primarily. Throw a few other scripture in there uh, as well, but that's the core of it. We've talked about it before, but if you're like me, and uh, probably many of you are, uh, there are certain uh, suppositions and presumptions that we operate in this world that we that we have about how things are. Um, here's a few of them, but there are many. But when I was between the ages of, say, 13 and 18, I had a theory, a supposition, that I knew more than my parents did. And what they told me, I was like, wait till I get to be 18. You ever heard that? When I get to be 18, I'm going to let y'all know all the stuff that I know that you didn't know. And then I got to be 18 and realized I didn't know anything that I thought that I knew. And that they knew a whole lot more. But that was a, that was a in theory, that sounded good. They only knew what I knew. Here's another supposition I had one time in my life. I know I don't have time to practice, but I'm still going to be a scratch golfer. For any of you that play, no. <laughs> That was not, <laughs> that sounded good, <laughs> but another supposition at some point in my life I had, and this was probably being a little bit too full of myself, but I thought, man, it's going to be great for the woman that gets to marry me. <laughs> I'm so in cool, I'm so enlightened, I'm so hip, I'm so with it. Man, what a privilege it's going to be to be with me. <laughs> that was a theory. <laughs> But presumptions and assumptions, uh, opinions, theories are all wonderful until they come face to face with reality. <laughs> and uh, that last one that I just said, it came face to face with reality with you, right, honey? <laughs> I wasn't all that. <laughs> oh, man. But, it, you know, and, and in fact, though, the way we visualize things and think that things are going to play out, they rarely, if ever, or don't ever, work out that way. This building's a good example. Man, we had, we planned, we worked hard, we did advanced planning. But every day, every week that was going by, there were things that had to be changed, decisions that had to be made. We can't do it this way. This problem came up. And we kept adjusting and going all the way through. Now, as it turned out, I feel like it turned out pretty good. But the point is, is that what we planned and how we visualized it, it changed changed when reality came on the scene. Now, this is especially true in our interaction with other people. <laughs> How we see it going does not always go that way. 
It just doesn't. There are more variables, I believe, in this area of life, relationship with others, than any other thing that we deal with. And considering that, loving others, as we just saw here and what Jesus has said, seems really straightforward in theory, but in reality, it can be difficult. It can be muddled. It can even be unpleasant at times. Has anybody ever experienced unpleasantness when dealing with others? You can say it. You don't have to say any names. But here's the good news. Jesus teaches that love is not just theoretical. It's deeper than that. It's something that's bigger than that. And so this thing that I want to talk about today, Matthew uh, chapter 22, is what we call the great commandments. Now, I have spoken about this many times over the years here in this church. But I think it's ground worth covering more than just once a year. And I'm going to tell you why. Because if Jesus said, this is the greatest and first commandment, I think I should pay attention to that. And then if he says, here's another one, and it's just like it, or a very close second, some translations say, or equally important, some translations say, I want to listen to that too. So we're going to talk about it today. So I'm going to give you a little context before I read the scripture. Um, the religious elite of the day despised Jesus. They, I mean, I'll just say they hated him. They were out to get him. And in Matthew chapter 22, if you read the whole chapter, you'll find a couple of places where they're trying to trick Jesus. The Pharisees came up with this thing that they wanted to try to, uh, to trick him with about, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Jesus shut that down. Then you go on to read on, and the Sadducees, they said, well, they didn't get it worked out. We're going to get together, and we're going to try to try to trip him up. The Sadducees and the Pharisees are what I call the king of the know-it-alls. They were just, they people, they thought they knew everything. So they were going to go to Jesus and talk to him about uh, marriage and widows and the resurrection and all of this. You can read it for yourself. I'm not going into that today. But that's what they tried to do. So then Jesus spoke into that situation and shut them down. So you think at that point they'd say, well, you know what? Let's come back another day. Let's try to fight another day. This guy's not, we can, we don't have, we're not matching wits with him. But no, the Pharisees regrouped, and they decided they were going to select an expert in the law, or a lawyer, as the, as the scripture in some translations say. They were going to have him go toe-to-toe with Jesus. Now, for a little more context here, there are 613, at that time, there were 613 commandments in the law, in the Jewish belief system. Uh, there were uh, a mix of those, and, and you'll see 365 of those were things that you were to abstain from or not do. Those were the negatives. Then there are 248 items that you, were, that you were required to do, that you should do, and those were the positives. So between all of those, that's called the mitzvah. If you, mitzvah, if you want to look at that up, you can see all of those if you wanted to, to, to so do it, but you don't need to. I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> but if you were an up, uh, upright person in the Jewish faith, that's how they measured your holiness. That's how you, were, how you were judged. So here's this lawyer now trying to disgrace Jesus in front of a crowd. And this is what it says. Matthew 22, this is verse 34, beginning in verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. That was his first mistake right there. <laughs> Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, he wanted Jesus to pick one of these 613. He wanted to narrow him down. Here's how Jesus answered. Now, Jesus knew the law better than any of those guys did. He knew the law. He knew it. This was coming from Deuteronomy and Leviticus. He could go back and say, but this is what Jesus said. Verse 37. And he said to them, Jesus said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And listen to this now. This is very important. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So as Jesus does so often, he simplifies the truth. Paraphrased, love God with everything you have. And love others every bit as much as you love yourself. He took 613 things and he boiled it down to two. Now, Jesus said, everything else that you've learned 
All of the Jews of the day, everything else, you've been trained, you've been brought up in synagogue, all of the law, everything that your parents taught you, that the rabbis taught you, everything that you're supposed to do as a good person in the Jewish faith, hang on these two things. Everything that you, it's basically like, not to say that some of those things aren't important, but these two are the most important. That's what he means when he says, on these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. So I think as I look at that, I'm thinking, well, you know, we can do those two things, can't we? (laughs) Seems to be pretty easy, right? We all want to love Jesus, love God. That's not so hard. Okay, love him. It also says with all of your heart, your mind, your soul. So that, that might be a little bit more difficult. But, but it seems like, love my neighbor. That seems like a reasonable thing. It sounds good, and I think I should do that. Yeah, I can do that. This won't be so hard. Theoretically, in theory, it sounds real good. Simple, straightforward, clear, not complicated. I can do this. However, uh-oh, here it comes. In the real world... Where the rubber meets the road, love is not so easy. I'm just here to tell you today, and if it is for you, please see me after and tell me your secret. It's not so easy, it can even be messy. Solomon wrote this interesting piece of wisdom. I'm reading Proverbs right now. I read a proverb a day. So each month I'm reading Proverbs. And uh, I don't think it's made me any wiser yet, but I'm hoping and praying that by the end of the year I might be. (laughs) But I'm, you know, so... But I, it, I read this in a, a few times, but it just sort of, it's so interesting. Proverbs 14, 4. This is what it says. Without oxen, a stable stays clean. But you need a strong ox for a large harvest. <laughs> Let me tell you something, folks. If you want a clean pasture, don't own any cows. But don't expect to be a successful dairy farmer either. I was in Montana last year. Beautiful, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. And have you ever seen a bison? They're like buffalo, but man, they're the most incredible animal. Huge. Just amazing to look at because you just don't see them all the time. And there was hundreds of these, or a couple of hundred of these bison. Remember, honey, in the field when we pulled over on the side of the road? And they're all out in this field. And we walked up, and there were other people doing it too, walked up right to the edge of where the field was. And right where I could stand, I could see what my friend used to call ground apples. Some people call them cow patties. You know what I'm talking about. And let me just say, these were something that you can't miss because they were huge. They were all over the place. So, I mean, into that thought, though, we could also say this. If we want things to be easier in our lives, don't interact with other people. I I mean, am I wrong? But here's the other thing, though. You won't have any of the advantages and the benefit of those interactions. And I say to you today that it is much more important to take that step. Now, some people want to put their own translation. Sometimes I say to people, this is the translation of Billy. In this verse that we just talked about, Matthew twenty two thirty nine, 39. And the New Living Translation, again, said Jesus is saying the two commandments, the great commandments, a second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Some of us want to translate that and interpret it a little bit. So, some people might think, well, must, does that include the neighbor that never mows his lawn and leaves his kids' toys strewn all over the front yard for me to see every time I drive away, drive by? Is that included in the neighbors that I got to love? Or the one that's been working on his car for the last year, it's up on blocks with all of his tools laying around in the driveway. Am I supposed to, to love that, that neighbor too? Or am I supposed to love the neighbor who parks on the street seemingly has 25 people living in a house made for five and don't use the driveway but park on the street. Am I supposed to love them too? There's a story in this church that I won't go into right now of somebody that parked their car on the street and every time another person, they're in this church now, they weren't then. The time this other person went by that did go to our church, every time he went by, some of you know this story, went by that car on his street, he blowed a horn at it. I don't know what was hoped to be accomplished there, but he did. 
good man, nothing wrong. I'm just saying that's what happened. So there you go, it was him. <laughs> no matter what time it was. <laughs> but you know what? God tends to take what the devil meant for evil and turn to good. Amen. That's William's story. <laughs> Do we love them too, man? They got their cars parked on the, on the driveway. The answer? Well, let me tell you one more story. I got to tell. I was not going to, but I'm going to now since Christina's here. We had a neighbor and we lived in Jacksonville. And I'll just put it this way. They had a dog that for whatever reason enjoyed using our yard as his restroom as opposed to the yard of his owner. Don't know why it appealed to him so much, but he did because it was on a regular basis. And on top of that, the owner decided that it wasn't necessary to clean up behind their pet. So when Billy walked out in his yard, he'd see these things and I'd clean it up because I didn't want to leave it there. But one time, I went out there and I didn't see it. And I stepped in it. And I didn't know I stepped in it. Then I got in my car. And it got on my carpeted mats. And at that point, I'm saying, somebody pray for me right now because I'm angry. I was not happy. But got over it and, you know, cleaned it up, whatever. So then... Uh, at some point later, Christina caught him in the act. The dog right over there by our mailbox, one of his favorite places to go. That was all you knew is going to be around there somewhere. And he's over there doing his business, and Christina got out there and went out there and talked to the people. She went out and talked to the owners of that dog and said, whatever she said, I wasn't there. Now, you know Christina, so it was probably done in the kindest way, but I must say it was a confrontation of some kind. We didn't hear anything else about it. They didn't say, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'll come clean that up right now. Oh, no, they didn't say that. I guess they thought it was organic fertilizer or something. Don't know. But what I do know is that they lived on one side of us, and then the neighbor on the other side, a couple of days later, came and told Christina, hey, I heard that you talked to the neighbors about their dog. And I'm like, how did they know about it? Because those guys were talking to them. I guess not happy about the fact that we let them know our yard is not a restroom. Or your pet. But did we love them? What if they don't vote like we do? What if they don't, what if they don't uh, 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 have the same like, values that we live our life by? What if they decide overtly and in front of everybody to choose a lifestyle that we don't agree with? I'm asking you today. Are they included in the group of people I need to love? And there is only one answer. And that answer is from the mouth of Jesus. Love them as you love yourself. And let me tell you something. That means the person that you have in your life or persons that you love more than anything in the world, you need to love them that much. Boy, it got quiet there. Come on, somebody. You got to. I'm not saying it's a whole thing today. It's not easy. So as what I'm telling you today is that it seems like now it's going to make it easier or harder for you to love somebody after all of this. Look, so here's the thing. In theory, it may sound doable. It may sound uh, that, you know, it, it, I can do this. But when the hypothetical meets the real, it can get tough really, really fast. But it doesn't relieve us of the obligation to follow the great commandment. I've said this before. You know, they don't call it the great suggestions. <laughs> Look up commandment. You'll see what it means. <laughs> so love is more than theoretical. So how did Jesus do that? Here's some real truth today too. I'm just going to pour it on, man. There are times when I look around people in this church and out of church that I know that are Christ followers. They love the Lord. I mean, there's not, and, but, and as I look at them, the more I get to know them and stuff, it just seems like their lives are needed in order. I, I mean, it's just sort of, not entirely, but I mean, it just, it just seems like that. Now, I'm going to say that includes Christine and I. People have said that about us. I'm like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, it just seems like it's all uh, packaged together and it, and it, and it looks, uh, looks, looks good. And, and most of us, or most of these people I'm referring to, are people that are trying to do the right things. They attend church. They, uh, they're trying to do the right things to follow Jesus. They, uh, they're doing life together. They are uh, involved. They... Uh, 
and this is me included, you know, they, 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 they're doing, trying to do all the right things, but at some point in time, we get to a place where we become inwardly focused. It's not anything that we do on purpose, it just happens. And this is, I'm saying, I am in this category too. And, it, and we might feel pretty good because we attend church, we're making time for daily devotion and prayer, we're trying to do all the right things, we may feel better even if we're in a life group, um, we're, we're, we're tithing, we're serving on a dream team. And by the way, I'm just going to say, if you're not in a life group in this church, I'm just going to say it like this, get in one. There are stories right now of people's lives being changed in these groups, people. Am I wrong? Hello? Am I wrong, people that are in them? Come on now. Help me out, somebody. You're telling me the stories. Look, all it is is get up Wednesday and Thursday. There's a list out there. You sign up. You haven't missed anything. You're not behind. Get in a group. Not so we can say that you're in it, so that you can have God work powerfully in your life. He's going to do things differently in circles than he does in rows. That's just the way God works. It's important. So anyway, but people are in that too. But we can get, all of those things are great too, absolutely. Everything I'm talking about, but people that are doing that, if you're doing some of them or all of them. But we can get in the mentality of status quo. It happens to me all the time. It's like now we can get comfortable. And, and I thought, you know, some people might say, well, I thought that was the whole point for us to be comfortable. Well, not entirely. Not as a Christ follower. This is why I'm laying some truth on you today. So it could be that our routines, even the positive ones, the things that are good, the things that I just talked about, keep us from connecting and developing real relationships where we share experiences with people who need Jesus. When we're inwardly focused, there's nothing wrong with that. We need to do it. We need to do life together. But it's more than that. It's not just love the others in your church. It said others is everybody. So... I feel like this. If we aren't taking action steps in our faith, don't get mad at me now. If we're not taking, if I'm not taking action steps in my faith, I don't know that I have very much faith at all. I don't know that I have enough faith for sure if I'm not taking action steps. Now, this is not me saying this. This is in the scripture. You can read Galatians chapter 3, first few verses. You can do that. You can read James chapter 2. You can read a lot of things, but these are things that I was reading. James chapter 2, the, this is not the whole, you read that whole chapter. You read the whole book of James, by the way, in about 15 minutes. And then people say, oh, well, I didn't realize that. I've never read the whole book. We'll do it. You can do it today. 15 minutes. Read the book of James. Or any other, well, the, a lot of the epistles are like that. But this is what it says in James chapter 2, verse 14. Beginning in verse 14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you can have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Well, no, because they don't know about it. <laughs> Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm, and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, listen now, Faith by itself isn't enough. This is the New Living Translation. Faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It's dead and useless. Now, that's not Pastor Billy laying this on you. That's the inspired word of God speaking into your life today. Amen. And speaking, just so you know, into mine. This is important stuff. But the life Jesus lived, if you look at Jesus' life through his whole life, the things that are recorded, he did not live a life of comfort. <laughs> he, he wasn't comfortable. And we spoke about Zacchaeus last week. Now, here's Zacchaeus. He's this guy detested by his community. Many people thought he was despicable. Jesus wanted to eat a meal with him and not just eat a meal, but eat it at his house. That couldn't have been comfortable because everybody around him criticized him for it. Jesus made it his practice to spend time at the tables to hang out with people who were not at all like him. That was what he did. Now, do we want to be more like Jesus? Come on, somebody. Do we want to be more like Jesus? If you don't, you're in the wrong place today. And if you don't, get that way. 
come down and decide I'm going to be that way, your life will change forever and you will be better off, I promise you. That is something I can put a guarantee on. If you truly follow Jesus and try to be more like him, just even a little bit every day, your life will change and it will be for the better, and I promise you that. There is not any ambiguity to that statement. But that's what Jesus did. People that the religious people of the day, they wouldn't even want to be seen on the same block as the people like that. They crossed the street to the other side so they didn't have to walk by them. But Jesus went and embraced them. He would spend time with those that others had forgotten. They had just cast aside the faceless, the nameless, people in the crowd, the outcast. That's who Jesus wanted to reach. That's who he wanted to be. He heard from them. He knew their name like we talked about last week. He was interested in their stories. He broke bread with them. He loved on them. He spoke truth into their life. Man, we need to do this. But now how will tell you, just like Jesus, you know that everybody that Jesus encountered didn't all respond to his message. It was like you think about, well, everybody Jesus talked to, man, they just got on board and went right with him. Uh Uh-uh. Who is that crowd out there yelling, crucify him? Who is that crowd saying, give us Barabbas? Crucify him. Give us him, this criminal that we know it was. There were a lot of people like that. Judas was like that, following him his whole life, seeing miracles, people raised from the dead, healed all the things that Jesus did, and Judas didn't listen to him. He was right there. Thief on the cross. One said yes, one said no. Everybody didn't respond to Jesus just like it is today. But many of them, so they just continued in their broken lives. But Jesus loved them all. It didn't matter what they did if they accepted him or not. He loved them all, every single one. And he proved it at the cross. See, at the cross and before that too, but at the cross particularly, Jesus proved it by his actions it wasn't talk anymore it wasn't teaching standing on a boat or on the mountainside and talking to people he proved it by his actions what he did he knew that this was more than hypothetical this was not just something to be a supposition it was the reason he came to this earth to love and to prove it at the cross To love and to work in and through the lives of everybody around him, whether they accepted him or not. Even if they rejected and despised him and called him names and and, 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 and mocked him, he loved them. But man, I tell you, okay, I'm going to wrap up here. C.S. Lewis wrote something in a book called The Four Loves. Anybody know who C.S. Lewis is? C.S. Lewis was a Christ follower, by the way. Not his whole life, but I mean, he was, a, he, was a, he was a person of great faith. But he wrote this in this book. He said this. There is no safe investment. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, remember what Solomon said about the stable? If you want to make sure of keeping your heart intact, you must give your heart to no one, even to an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. C.S. Lewis knew that playing it safe and not having the courage to enter and encounter the challenges that may come along with extending love was the wrong way to live. And I'm here to tell you today I agree with him. It's the wrong way to live. Now, just like eating ribs or crab legs, have you ever seen those things when you eat those things they put a big plastic bib around you? They need that for me because I get butter stains and barbecue all over. When I eat, there's just no way you can eat that stuff and that not be messy. Of course, I've refused to wear them because I feel like I look so ridiculous. But I don't know if I look more ridiculous with all the stains on my shirt when I leave. So, But it's messy eating those. One of my favorite things to eat is crab legs. But I just don't, I mean, it, it, anyway, it doesn't matter. But just like eating food like that, it can be messy. It's just not something 
that's easy loving others all the time. And it can be even scary sometimes about entering into relationships, whatever the potential cost might be. It can be frightening. But it doesn't always have to be that way. It gets easier. It gets better. But you have to start. You have to take action. Because your faith without actions, without good deeds, without works, is dead. That's the scripture says. Ask our praise team to come, please. So, here's something Mother Teresa said. If there's anything about a person who exemplified sacrifice, putting her self at the end of the list and others before her and you know living a life of poverty whatever uh, you have to a lot of things about her you have to admire and she said this never worry about numbers never worry about numbers so I'm not here today to say you got to every single go out and reach everybody in Clay County walk down the street and take the voter roll and check off everybody's name but I'm asking you I'm challenging you to do something different Something different. Don't worry about the numbers. Help one person at a time. And here's the easy part. And always start with the person nearest you. Just find somebody. Love stops becoming a kind concept when we actually start loving the people around us. When the hypothesis becomes an act, now when we take an action on it, it's going to expose some vulnerabilities in us. It's going to expose some frailties and even weaknesses. But guess what? You have something show up in your life. I've experienced this. Maybe something you've never experienced before. And here's what's going to show up in your life. You will see the power of God manifest in your life when you take that step. You'll see it. Paul wrote about this. The Apostle Paul, the one who persecuted Christians, hated them, and then was delivered into a life of being the greatest missionary and church planner that there ever was by the power of God, by a miracle of God. Saul went from that way, 180 degrees going that way, became the Apostle Paul. Here's what he wrote. My grace, talking about God now, my grace is all you need. And listen to this. My power works best in weakness. The English Standard Version says, My power is made perfect in your weakness. The weaker we are, the more powerful God is. Do you get that? Come on, somebody. Do you get that? The weaker we are, that's against everything that the world tells us. So Paul goes on to say, So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work in and through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses. It wasn't enough. He had to keep on about it. And the insults, the hardships, persecutions, and troubles. Let me tell you something, folks. It is very likely, and I think almost certain, that none of us will ever experience the insults, the persecutions, the difficulties, the hardships that the Apostle Paul did. But he did it. He's just a man like everybody else. Come on, he's not. We, we can do this. But he says he takes pleasure in it. And the troubles that he suffers for Christ. Because here's the thing that God put in his spirit that he knew that he's teaching us today. For when I am weak, then I am strong. If you want to be strong in your faith, be willing to be weak sometimes. Be vulnerable. Let some of the frailties and insecurities you have just be there because the power of God will be made perfect in that and fill you up with the opportunity to do things that on your own you couldn't do. That's the Word of God. Isaiah 40, 29. Man, I love this. I just love this. It's so simple. Listen to this. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. See, it's a good thing, as Lewis was saying, to just take a chance. Put it out there. And think about Jesus for a moment. He came. He lived on this earth. He did all that he did. And he died a criminal's death. Why? So we could be children of God. 
That's why he did it. He did it because he loved us so much. He wanted us to be able to make a pathway so that we could be reconciled forever to the Father if we choose to do that. He made that pathway for us. So if, look, if Jesus can do all that, I think, I hope, I hope, folks, that we all can take the risk to step into the unknown to get our hands a little dirty if that's what requires, to, to, to put up with the messiness that it might be sometimes of loving others. I hope we could do that because of what Jesus did for us and because he commands us to love others. So most times in life, as I said earlier, things are not as easy as we think that they may have been at the beginning. What is the theoretical when it turns into the real, it's, it's, it's always different. But I'm just going to say this to you. The process of doing, working through the different and the uncomfortable, the process of doing it will make a permanent impact on your growth. Not only as a person, and it will that too, it'll make your spiritual growth be ignited like somebody took a match to it. It'll accelerate it. And last week we had a challenge to, to know someone's name. Here's your challenge this week. Love others. Take it from a concept, make it a reality. It starts maybe in a restaurant, a coffee shop. I can give you a couple of examples, but you don't need to love someone this week. Start with one, do one a week. Set a goal of one a week. I'm going to do this. Somebody. I'm going to do something. It could be anything. It could be contact someone you haven't spoken with in a while that, that could use something to hear from them. Buy a box of cookies or a little bag of groceries, some essentials, and just take it to somebody and say, hey, I had some extra groceries. I just want to give you this and let you know God loves you. God loves you. Can you do that? Anybody can do this. Think about finding someone you can mentor or encourage, just somebody that you can just speak words of encouragement, speak words of truth and life through Christ into their life. Buy someone a cup of coffee or their meal. I did this one time because somebody did it for me. It wasn't my idea. They, I, they, I, they bought my meal. I bought somebody's meal and wrote a little note on there one time. Just wanted to ha let you know that I hope you have a blessed week and that God loves you. They never met me. Now, in some cases, it would be that you could meet them. I didn't want to try to like have anybody like, to take any credit for it. It was just like, but whatever it is, God will speak into your life if you're open and willing to do this. Write a short note, a handwritten note to someone that, that, that just needs to hear from you. That note, if you pray over it and God leads you and puts a person in your mind and you take that act of love and send it to someone, he's going to put an anointing on that and it might hit their life right at the moment they need it. But it takes us. We've got to be the ones to do this. So you get the idea. Start small. Develop a habit. Do something. Do something. Take action. Set a goal. Once a week is good. Twice a week is better. <laughs> but just once a week. Start thinking about it right now and take action. Put some good deeds with your faith. And see what God will do. Not just in their life. See what he'll do in yours. I promise you, the power of God's going to manifest itself in the places where you feel vulnerable or you feel insecure or you feel weak. He's going to show up there.